Welcome to this seminar today, and today's webinar marks the launch of the new book, A Global Citizenship Education in the Global South. We will have the pleasure to hear the editors, Emiliano Bozio and Yusef Bagit, and some of the book contribute and some of the book's contributors exploring the book's key themes and findings and address some important questions, like for instance, how educators located in the global south perceive and implement global citizenship education? I think it's a really interesting question and um, the, the, the interest in this book and in this event proves that, that there is a, a huge interest in the, in the academic field to know more about how global uh, south perceive and implement global citizenship education. So, as said before, we will have the pleasure to hear Emiliano Bosio. He's one of the book editors and he's professor at Toyo University in Japan. We, 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 have, we will have Yusef Varid, from, uh, also book editor from uh, Stalinboch University in South Africa. We will have Viel Bengalers, from, uh, series editor, is an emeritus professor at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. We have also the pleasure to have Manisha Shelat from India, a professor and chair of the Center for Development Management and Communication at MICA. Um, and we'll have also Jude Terblanche from South Africa, professor at the University of Western Cape, and uh, Charlene van der Waard from so South Africa, also head of the department, University of KwaZulu and Natal. So we have uh, lots of important guests today speaking to us about the Global South and Global Citizenship Education. I thank especially Emiliano, a very engaged member of ANGEL, the opportunity of having this webinar and of hosting this webinar within the ANGEL community. Thank you very much, Emiliano, for that. Thank you, thank you. So good afternoon, good morning, or even good evening, depending on where you are located today. And uh, greetings from Tokyo, Japan. And let me begin by thanking the Academic Network on Global Education and Learning Angel for hosting this book uh, launch. And of course, Angel Advisory Board member Lazareta Coelho for being our chair uh, today. I also want to thank Youssef, Yael, Manisha, Charlene, Judith. Uh, these are excellent scholars and friends, and they do an outstanding work on global citizenship education uh, with a particular focus on uh, social justice and uh, social uh, change. And uh, Youssef and I currently are co-editing uh, three uh, important special issues. And the first special issue in Springer UNESCO IB Prospects focuses on global citizenship education curriculum and pedagogy in the global south, embracing the decolonial shifts. And then the second special issue in citizenship teaching and learning examines global citizenship education critical perspectives from international educators and then the third special issue in SAGE Journal of Creative Communications focuses on global citizenship, critical and creative practices in the digital age. And we are co-editing this specific special issue with Mariana Papastofono based in Cyprus and Peter McLaren, who is based in the United States. So if you're interested in these topics, uh, please do get in touch with me or with Youssef. So what is interesting about the panel here today is that you will get uh, diverse perspectives on global citizenship education from scholars located in Japan, South Africa, the Netherlands. And uh, also uh, we must consider that we have a large international audience uh, and some attendees are new to GC. And so this includes some of my students. I will therefore focus on three key uh, points. First, how the idea of the book Global Citizenship Education in the Global South developed and how global citizenship education is conceptualized uh, in our book. Secondly, I will address the book key themes. And lastly, 
I will talk about uh, why, I will describe why the idea of global citizenship education in the global South is at the same time needed and powerful. So let me begin by discussing how the idea of our book, Global Citizenship Education in the Global South, developed and how global citizenship education is discussed by scholars in this uh, book. So global citizenship education calls for the education of values and knowledge that potentially help learners to become critical, emancipated, and responsible global citizens. And yet, Youssef and I realized that there has been little coverage on how educators located in the global south, for example, South Africa, Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, Malawi, Ghana, India, China, Zimbabwe, Mexico, and Jordan perceive global citizenship education and implement it into curricula and classroom practices. And so to fill in the gap, our book aims to begin a critical discussion that brings contemporary academic debate about Southern theory to global citizenship education. And this is, we believe, an important task considering that the majority of the writings on global citizenship education, both theoretical and empirical, suffer from a predominant focus on North America and parts of Western Europe. And so in its unique way, our volume seeks to readdress this imbalance. And it does so by adding cases uh, from the Global South where GCE is increasingly recognized within scholarly pedagogical discourses and the literature. And so we believe that the global South uh, might be geographic, such as in the case of South Africa or India, but it is also more importantly, political, pedagogical, economic, cultural, and theoretical. And so for this reason, uh, we situate the discussion around global citizenship education uh, within um, within a critical and decolonial paradigm informed on a fundamental level by the values and knowledge of critical pedagogy ingrained in social justice. And so a critical and decolonial global citizenship education approach as the one we have chosen in this book attempts to rectify injustice exploitation and inequality that is inflicted on former colonies through neocolonization. And so in this view, our book is also an attempt to shift the dominant ways in which the relationships uh, between Western and non-Western people are viewed. Overall, um, we approached this book as an opportunity to engage uh, critically with uh, global citizenship education and to gain insight on whether the notion of a global citizenship education uh, could represent a potential distinct pedagogical framework to reimagine uh, citizenship education in a more critical and ethical perspective, which has its foundation in critical, transformative, humanistic, and ethical theories. And so global citizenship education, as discussed in our book and uh, my recent and less recent publications, is not an educational philosophy that exists for a global elite. Rather, GCE, as discussed in our book, is a philosophical, ethical platform, a pedagogy of value oriented towards social justice that gives our students a meaningful way to examine our shared planet. And so from these perspectives, 
uh, one uh, or some of the central orientations of global citizenship education are promoting social justice and a reduction of global and local inequality with the fundamental aim to assist learners, particularly those located in the global south, in reflecting critically on their opinions and to assist them in being part of the creation of a new future with its roots in social justice and sustainability. Let me now discuss the main themes and structure of the book. So the book is divided into three main themes with each team having a number of chapters covering diverse perspectives with international educators from a range of countries in the global South. And so the first theme is critical consciousness, decolonialism, caring ethics, eco-critical views, and humanity empowerment in global citizenship education. And this includes my chapter with Youssef, titled Global Citizenship Education for Critical Consciousness Development, as well as chapters written by Nahima Spoon, Said Eftkar, Joel Kayombo, Mjech Kinyota, Lysol Freak, Kiran Batia, Greg, and uh, Manisha. The second theme is equality and diversity in global citizenship education policy and practice. And this includes chapters by Jonathan Felix, Simon Ayton, Yoman Hawad, Patricia Karbalhail, He Hong, and Judith and Charlene, who are with us uh, today and will speak later. And the third and last theme is defamiliarization, hukama, and active protest in global citizenship education. And this includes chapters by Zahid Wagdid, Josef Fungui, Taksani Batubula, Tiffany Banda, and a concluded chapter uh, written by me and Yousef titled Democratic Pluralistic Global Citizenship Education, Embracing Educators' Voices from the Global South. And so, as you can tell, our book embraces a wide range of themes with diverse scholars located in the Global South in the field of global citizenship education, but also in inter international comparative education and educational philosophy. I will conclude uh, by addressing a key question. And the question is, why is our book, Global Citizenship Education in the Global South, at the same time needed and powerful. And I believe here that the answer is quite straightforward. This book is needed and powerful from three different perspectives at least. First, while some previous studies have been devoted uh, to a critical analysis of global citizenship education, it is uncommon uh, for this literature to reflect or even embrace the voices of educators teaching global citizenship in the global south. There is also, we believe, an absence of discourse on the pedagogical and theoretical approaches to global citizenship at the local level. And here I like to stress the fact that when we're talking about global citizenship education, we are discussing both the local and the global. The two are fundamentally interconnected. The second point is that this book is the first to focus on a critical examination of global citizenship education by educators and researchers from the global south who possess a solid expertise in international studies and comparative education. Of course, we also have emerging scholars contributing to this book. And finally, this book serves as a roadmap to significant global citizenship educational experiences in the Global South. And so from this angle, we strongly believe that the perspectives presented in this book are aimed at three different groups. Educators who are focused, focused on putting the theoretical knowledge of global citizenship into practice in the classroom, 
researchers who have a specific interest in better understanding global citizenship, and general audience who has an interest in better understanding the philosophy, history, and practice of global citizenship education. And so from this perspective, as Professor Andrea Silumamba, president of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies, and Viel, who is here with us today, suggested in their forewords to our book, the volume global citizenship education in the global South is powerful and needed because it encourages readers to acknowledge that GCE, global citizenship education, has the potential to represent much more than a just fashionable synonym for international learning outcomes. Rather, global citizenship education, as described by the educators in our book, represents a forward-thinking framework, a forward-looking framework with the potential to contribute significantly to the creation of a society with greater justice, respect for human dignity, and a common collective well-being, and I would say, I would add, world peace. And so when discussed in this view, global citizenship education can become a pedagogy of hope, a pedagogy of empowerment, an ethical pedagogy, or even what Columbia University professor David Hansen refers to as the poetics of teaching, whereby educational institutions, educators, and learners can demonstrate that they have not become naive in their assessment of political and moral issues. And so, and I conclude, the researchers that contributed to this volume did, in our opinion, an excellent job in examining global citizenship education as more than just service delivery, because it is, and it should be, a method of conscientization or critical consciousness development, a notion developed by the pedagogue Paul O'Reilly. And so conscientization refers to gain a deep knowledge of the world, which allows for the perception and exposure of social and political contradictions, as well as identity development to the transmission of values, knowledge, and skills across generations. And so Freddie's concepts of critical identity development particularly resonates with our book on GC in the Global South, because it is a reminder that education and especially global citizenship education should not, and I repeat, should not be considered a transcend uh, or a transcendent activity removed from the challenges of daily life. Rather, GC teaching and learning should be about those daily classroom pedagogic practices aimed at promoting and enhancing learners' humanity and critical consciousness as the educators in this book demonstrated in excellent ways. And let me conclude with the words of Nelson Mandela contained in his autobiography, Long Way to Freedom. Education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, the son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine, and that the child of a farm workers can become the president of a great nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emiliano, for this powerful presentation. I am sure that you you transmitted you. you you showed a lot to us the, the the power also of this book through your presentation. Thank you for that. So we move on after this presentation from Emiliano that presented the book structure, the main key, the key themes, and why the mission of this book is very important. We will go to Yusef Varit for the, the also the book editor, co-editor, also to present uh, us a bit about this, to discover, uncover a bit of, uh, of the book to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lasselet, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. It's um, 
for 1422 in South Africa. I thought what attracted me uh, to this particular book and the way we framed the book, um, I want to mention uh, three aspects. If one has to look at global citizenship um, in the context of our understanding, then it seems that what is constitutive of global citizenship is the idea of transcending individual autonomy. It is not simply what individuals do on their own, but more importantly, what individuals do with others. So I think it's a matter of transcending individual autonomy, recognizing that individuals can assert their voices, but that their voices will be more profound if those voices are connected with in relation to other voices. And often those other voices are not the same voices. It can be home or heterogeneous voices. But in the sense that I understand the framework of this book is that there's an interconnectedness between a, plu a pluralistic voices. So it's recognizing that there are others in the world and that there are others that we connect with and that our own individual autonomies are not as important as our relational encounters with others. So that to me seems to be the uh, most uh, significant constitutive aspect of this particular understanding of global citizenship we encounter. The second aspect I would imagine <laughs> derives from a theory of democratic politics and the understanding is that global citizenship education, as Emiliano correctly articulated, is a form of critical and I would argue transcritical praxis. So it's not just a matter of humans interacting, but when they encounter one another, they also engage in processes of iteration. So here we talk about iteration as a form of articulation, speaking one's mind, listening to what the other has to say, and more importantly, creating the spaces for others to talk back. Because if others can talk back and take um, um, articulations into a form of inquiry, controversy rather, then the notion of a kind of dissonant dissonant thinking might evolve. So democratic iterations is important for any notion of global citizenship education because when people encounter one another, there cannot just be spaces for agreement, but also for dissonance, for disagreement. And we do not always have to work towards consensus. There can also be a, an emphasis on dissensus. And that seems to be an underlying um, virtue of this notion, if I can call it a virtue of global citizenship education. So you exercise your responsibility as both an individual and society vis-a-vis -vis the notion of iteration, because you recognize the significance of critique and dissonance as important virtues of your global citizenship encounters. And that seems to be, for me, the second virtue. The third one is that in, in, in the neo freudian sense, as Emiliano also articulated, is the notion that we cannot talk plausibly of any notion of global citizenship education if this kind of education does not result or lead you or provoke you to bring about a form of disruption in societies. And this form of disruption in societies can take the form of a quest for justice, a quest for social justice. And in that sense, global uh, proponents of a global citizenship education we espouse are in fact intellectual, political, social activists. So they want to see a transformation of 
the world and events within the world. And if it deals with pedagogy, it's about transforming um, teaching and learning and management and leadership within the context of what it means to aspire towards matters that are socially just. So that seems to be the conceptual framework that underlies, underscores our notion. I have a very active kitten here who's performing, so just excuse him. So it seems to be um, a notion of global citizenship, edu citizenship education constituted by a recognition of plurality of voices, a notion of citizenship education that is constituted by the presence and the enactment of um, democratic iterations and of course, an aspiration and, an, and a cultivation of social justice in society. So when we, Naima Husband uh, from Jordan and I, looked at our particular chapter and our analysis of migration in our two societies, Jordan and South Africa, I don't see Naima here, so I will talk on her behalf. So when we looked at um, um, migration, the movement of people from one society to the other, and in particular in her country, uh, Syrians moving into the society of Jordan. And in, in my case, Africans moving into the domain of, if I can call it, Southern Africa. Then what happened was we looked at those developments and then asked the question, how would global citizenship education respond to the practice of migration? And we had one thing in mind, and that was, we can never have migrate, a form of migration whereby people are stealthily assimilated into a society. And when people are, it's, it's a word I've borrowed from the, um, Stanford uh, ed philosopher uh, of education, Eamon Callan, he talks about uh, stealth assimilation. So I've borrowed that word from him. When we talk about stealth assimilation, we talk about one community being integrated in another society, but without them knowing they are their values, their practices, their belief systems, their traditions, are being assimilated and even undermined within the dominant hegemonic uh, notion of societal living. So when we looked at migration of Syrians into Jordan and of course, Southern Africans, as Africans into Southern Africa, we thought it global, if they were to practice global citizenship, if they were to engage in genuine global citizenship encounters, it would resist any form of oppression or assimilation, stealthily or not, into uh, the he hegemonic discourses of society. Because that is how people retain their identities. It is not that they must not mix with others, but when they do mix with others, they can autonomously contribute and enhance the conversation. So we used our uh, paradigmatic approach to global citizenship, couched in the virtues I've mentioned, and then rethought and re-looked the notion of migration, and then of course how it impacts education in, in, our, in those two countries. And our understanding is that when when we look at migration as a, a resistance to a form of stealth assimilation, then there will be more opportunities for humans, for people, for teachers, for learners, for students to engage more credibly in encounters than it would have been without uh, the virtues of global citizenship education we, we espoused throughout uh, the, the book. 
So we consider our own contribution as a manifestation of the global citizenship education in the South approach, where South often refers to the marginalized, to the excluded, and we kind of collapse virtues of global citizenship education into our understanding of education and other forms of human practices. Thank you. Thank you, Yusef. Thank you for bringing these virtues of global citizenship education, these polyphonic uh, uh, values and, and, and voices. Uh, thank you for bringing these and also for addressing this migration issue as an example of your contribution, because also in the in the chat, some questions already raised uh, have been raised about migration and migrants. So there is uh, certainly a topic that interests uh, a lot uh, at this moment. So thank you very much, Yusef, for this. And so we continue our our um, our presentations. And now we ha will have Vil, an emeritus pro emeritus professor of education at the University of Humanistic Studies at Utrecht, Netherlands, and um, is here as the editor of Education for Democratic International Citizenship. So he is the the editor, the serious editor. Thank you very much, Vil, for being here with us. I'm very happy to be in this meeting. And I also want to congratulate Emiliano and Yusef, the editors of the book, and also all authors of the, of the book with this great, interesting and important book. I read the draft uh, text of the book and it's, it's very, very interesting. And it shows many different aspects of global citizenship education and many contributions from different parts of the world. I think it's an excellent book. So I'm very happy that this book has been published now and that's part of our book series. So the book series uh, we have at Brill um, is called Moral Development and Citizenship Education. And this is volume 21. And in our series, we really want to connect moral education and citizenship education because we think Para, and then I'm paraphrasing Paula Freire, the moral should be more political and the political should be more moral. I think this book really fits well in our book series. And we had already a, a book about Latin, uh, citizenship education in Latin America, edited by, uh, by, by uh, Benil de Cabrero Garcia. And we also in different books, we had contributions from, from India, from Israel, from South Africa. And uh, so we had already some voices of the, the Global South, but it's very good now to have a real one book about with, with the Global South perspective. So I'm also speaking on, on behalf of my co-editor, uh, Professor Kirsi Thierry of the University of Helsinki and our editorial board, so that we are very happy with this book in our series. I want to speak a little bit more about citizenship education and about the book. And several articles have been writing about the change that has been taking place in the concept of citizenship. Originally, it was only on the political level. Nowadays, citizenship, the concept of citizenship, is used in, in theory, in, in, in policy, and also in practice also on the level of the social and how people relate to each other and also on the cultural level. What are important uh, aspects, important books, important ideas uh, uh, that, that should be stressed in citizenship education. So the, so the concept of citizenship has been deepened from the political to the social and the cultural uh, uh, level, but also the, the concept has been uh, uh, broadened. Originally, the concept was only on the, uh, related to the national situation, the, the national citizenship. Nowadays, you also have a regional citizenship, for example, European citizenship related to the European Union. But also, nowadays, people speak about global citizenship education. So the concept of citizenship and citizenship education had changed a lot the past decades. 
And this book is also a very good example in both the way the concept has been broadened into global citizenship and also how it has been deepened to the social and cultural level. Going to the concept of global, of global and then in particular the concept of globalization, I think the concept of globalization is a neutral term. It's about connecting people, connecting different parts of the world. And it is the ideology that embedded it in it that shows how, how a global, global uh, globalization takes a, a certain uh, a certain appearance, a certain certain uh, view. For example, you have a, a neoliberal market oriented uh, conception of globalization, but also you have more the moral ideas about global globalization and global citizenship from Nussbaum and Sen about human rights. But also you can have can, you can have an, uh, more social justice oriented ideas of global citizenship education, and that's more the direction that this book is going. And I think that's very important. It's, and it's very important that in in, in in academic work work, people use different perspectives and are aware of different perspectives. So so not so we shouldn't use concepts like global citizenship education too general and too easily. We really should analyze what's the ideology that is embedded in it. Going on with thinking about ideology and, and about the book, I really like the work of Joel Spring. He has a very interesting book in 2004, how educational ideology are shaping global society. And he distincts at that time four, four ideologies. And the first one is, uh, is a, a market oriented. Um, the first one is a nationalist uh, education. That's about building a society, building a nation. It's about the, the own history of the country. The second ideology is schooling uh, workers for a global free market. It's more the economic oriented uh, ideology, in particular emphasized by the World Bank and IMF. And the third ideology is distinguished. He calls it globalizing morality with human rights education. And that's more the UNESCO uh, view on, on, um, uh, on, on global citizenship education. So that's the third ideology. And the fourth ideology is about uh, about environmental education, the eco pedagogy, like Greg is uh, speaking about. So these four ideologies spring distinguish. But after reading the book, I want to add two more ideologies, two more bottom up ideologies that are really present in the book. The first two of of, of uh, ideology of of of. Um, uh, uh, of spring, the nationalist ideology and the market and, and, and the market uh, ideology, they are top down. The globalizing morality with human rights education and also the env environmental education, they, you could say they are more horizontal. But but in this book, we really can see two ideologies that are also at work in global citizenship education. And they are more bottom up. And the first one is about social justice and about combating inequality. There's a real strong voice in the book, the social justice approach and combating inequality. And the second one is strengthening local communities and traditions. So like Yusuf also was saying that we should, we should combine the local and the global. So the local is very important uh, and, and we should think about that and also as a kind of ideology. So people, people need, and then I can use the, 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 the term of, uh, of Putnam and bonding, the work, that re people really need some local connection. A global citizenship uh, should combine all these different perspectives, but in particular the bottom-up perspectives 
that are so so shown so 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 ha that are, have been showing so strongly in the book chapters. So the focus on social justice and the focus so focusing on the local community. So I'm very happy with this book. I think it's a very good contribution to our book series. And 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 I also will encourage Brill to pay a lot of attention to the book on different conferences. And uh, and again, I want to thank Emiliano and Youssef for for bringing it together and coming to our series. And uh, I really enjoyed this meeting also. And congratulations again to all of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Viel. It was a pleasure to hear this, to, to this highlight of the importance of the book in the series and the, in the in the editor. So thank you very much for that, and also thank you for you know for uh, help us uh, to think about ideologies. Sometimes is a condemned wor uh, word. <laughs> so thank you for you know bringing this this word in, into life and also to reimagine new ide ideologies through this book. So thank you very much for, for adding this to this discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and we move to Manisha, Manisha Shalat from India. Uh, she's, as I said before, professor and chair of the Center for Development Management and Communication at Mika. So Manisha, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I would begin with congratulations to Dr. Bozio, Dr. Vahid, and all the authors on publication of this excellent volume. My co-author Kiran Bhatia and I are really delighted to be part of this project because normally, you know, Global South is lumped as one chapter, you know, or maybe a couple of paragraphs as a token acknowledgement in the so-called global endeavors, as if it were a monolith. This volume promises to bring out nuances and specific context you know, of various countries and cultures in the global south. And so we really think that this is a much needed step. So congratulations once again. Kiran and I have contributed a chapter on geopolitical epistemies in global citizenship education, a post-colonial approach in this book. So in this chapter, we offer a post-colonial framework for global citizenship education, drawing from our work in India, a very long-term ethnographic work in Indian cities, as well as uh, some of the rural areas, and also drawing you know, from work from other scholars in the field. So what we intend to offer is a proposition that global citizenship education especially involving countries of the global south, must acknowledge how the history of colonial trauma influences the quotidian forms of meaning making and also practice. We believe that though our work is primarily based in India, the chapter will be of relevance to other parts of the world also because of the analysis and the future directions that we offer in this chapter. So first, we challenge the dominant epistemologies grounded in Eurocentrism. We discuss epistemic violence that deals with questions of the influence of colonialism over knowledge production. That is processes through which we privilege some voices. You know how some voices and stories are valued while some others are ignored or silenced. These processes, and this is a very important point that we think that these processes can also be witnessed in the South-South relationship and also within the countries of Global South. So here we use the term colonial in a very broad sense. Second, in this chapter, we challenge some of the popular assumptions that we carry. So for example, the assumption that countries have a common history or the assumption that the past can be left behind and does not influence our present and future. And the assumption, and this is a very widespread assumption, that technologies are neutral artifacts designed to democratize communication. 
So while we were working with our students, we also observed that our students also carry certain assumptions. So for example, in India, when we discuss global citizenship with our students, global inevitably meant the West, that is the UK, US, Canada, or maybe Australia and a few countries of the European Union, only a few countries of the European Union. And it was something aspirational and desirable. So for them, global was a position to be acquired rather than a site for equal participation. So when we want to challenge these popular assumptions about our understanding of the global, it requires developing a critical framework to engage with questions of how power hierarchies, histories of violence and domination, and geopolitical relation of modernity are important for understanding global citizenship. We understand that there is a vast scholarship in the field, but we also found that very few studies highlight ways in which a post-colonial approach can be used to revise our engagement with global citizenship education. And we have begun with that in this chapter. This is the second offering of the chapter. And since the book is presented as a pedagogical tool, right, for discussion and critical reflection, I think this framework is of special relevance to the readers of the book. So while developing this framework, we emphasize the importance of asking certain questions, like how do we learn about our place in the world, engage with differences, as uh, Professor Vahid rightly pointed out, create a shared sense of justice without invisibilizing the distinct pasts and present, and translate these theories and experiences for our younger generations. How do we teach and practice? the core values of global citizenship education when countries or groups of people have the burden of a long history of animosity. They have bitter memories associated with each other and a lot of unresolved grievances. And I think this is the biggest challenge in front of us as educators. But at the same time, we as global citizenship educators or scholars also, you know, we have, the, our eyes have to be really set on the peace, equity and justice, however utopian this may sound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a shared global vision. And so we don't want to lose ourselves or get bogged down by the weight of histories and conflicts. So our mission has to be still something futuristic, positive, and hopeful. So to translate this framework into practice, uh, in this chapter, we have suggested three core actions uh, uh, with suggestions on how to carry them out with our students, either in the classrooms or even in the non-formal settings. So our first uh, suggestion for action is helping students to challenge the dominant epistemologies through immersion in their local cultures and contexts, not in an abstract way. So this has to be a really immersive exercise with students. Second, discussing the geographical and generational histories and their association with contemporary lived realities. So this is the part we call critical and reflexive remembering, you know, that we have to acknowledge what happened in the past and how it is influencing the way we see people, the way we see the world, other countries. And the third, and this is, I think, the most important and unique dimension of our framework, and that is conscious forgetting. Conscious forgetting of the history of strained interrelations while finding new and more effective ways of healing the wounds and the memory. The memory of the trauma, you know, that people have experienced through various forms of colonization. So in a sense, we say that how do we remember the event and forget the effect? This has been our major challenge. 
the effect, the pain and hatred, and we build bridges consciously and collectively across local and national boundaries in the global realm. So we very strongly feel that we don't want our student to associate global, associate, uh, global citizenship education with only anger and guilt. We want them to move forward. And that's why conscious forgetting is a very important dimension of our framework. So as pointed out, this book is designed with the intent to contribute towards a possibility of imagining a yet to come critical transformative and post-colonial global citizenship education curriculum beyond the westernized market-oriented uh, and up political practices. And we're looking towards a more sustainable paradigm based on principles of mutuality and reciprocity. And this is why we believe that our post-colonial framework contributes to this larger mission of the book. So Kiran and I sincerely believe that the book will receive an enthusiastic response from all over the world, not only from Global South. And that is what we are really looking forward to. And uh, I congratulate again all the authors and Dr. Bozio and Dr. Vahid for this excellent endeavor. Thank you. And thank you all for being here and uh, listening to my views. And we sincerely want to refine this framework forward. So all your feedback is very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you for bringing this colonial past, these power hierarchies that still uh, having reflections today uh, in our in, in our daily life. So thank you for bringing these, also for bringing these epistemicides that are happening all the time all over the world. So thank you for bringing also this reflection about uh, the, the epistemological um, point uh, of, of global citizenship education, and also for the pedagogical tools that you that you that you propose to us to address these profound challenges that you that you face in your in your classroom thank you very much for this um i think everyone is now <laughs> thinking about you know eager to read the, the the chapters that you are that you are uh, presenting to us so thank you very much for this sharing now judith now it's your it's your turn so judith is a professor at the university of western cape in south africa so thank you judith for being here uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I must say that um, Charlene is is actually going to lead uh, the conversation. Um, so, Charlene, over to you, and I'll I'll, I'll chip in um, where appropriate. Well, colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to share something of our ongoing and creative conversation with you. You can already see in this uh, call, this is the nature of our uh, working together. Um, Judith and I have known each other since we were first years at university. And since then, we have basically agreed on nothing. Um, and that is the heart of our collaboration. We, we disagree about everything. And yet, Emiliano and Yusuf have found a way to bring us together to think about something that's really important to both of us. And, and I think our contribution fits very much into the frame of, of a social justice contribution we, we are both passionate about teaching for change. And, and I think uh, what we have found in this community and in this collaboration has really been a creative space for us to, to think about what we do, how we do it, and to keep on asking each other uh, critical questions. Um, so thank you, uh, firstly, for including us and for allowing us to, to keep on um, having this creative conversation with each other. So the context of our contribution to the book um, is the pervasive and, and terrifying reality of gender-based violence in the South African uh, context. The contribution draws on work that um, we have implemented at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, working with faith leaders, uh, so people who are usually second career students coming to, to the university, and who are faith leaders, people who are already situated in positions of power uh, within faith communities and exploring with them um, uh, these realities. Um, and 
I mean, Judith and I come from very different uh, theoretical landscapes. I come from theology and Judith from accounting and auditing. And maybe people would ask, like, how do we even bring these conversations together? But I think uh, Judith's expertise around um, global citizenship education is really also uh, strongly informed our conversation. So a key question we ask is why, amid so many uh, intervention strategies and and attempts to make an uh, impact against uh, gender-based violence in South Africa, why does it remain so pervasive? Um, and I think the work the work of um, the scholar Rachel Jukes has helped us a lot to try to think a little bit about the root causes. So what ideologically informs um, gender-based violence in South Africa? So Rachel Jukes, based at the Medical Research Council in Pretoria, makes the point that ideological gender-based violence can be hooked to two points. Firstly, the ideology of male superiority, and sec secondly, a culture of violence. Um, so in my own work, I've, I've done quite a bit to illustrate how religion informs these ideologies, how the reading of our, script, our, our sacred scriptures and, and also uh, the rituals within our faith communities inform the ideology of male superiority. We read sacred scriptures that, that speaks of, of a patriarchal frame. We read the Sunday after Sunday and, and also sometimes very violent uh, pieces of material. And, and we believe that this informs um, this reality. And then I think in the South African context, it's impossible to think about um, these realities without thinking about the history of inequality that, that our, our system is in, embedded in. So uh, there's great scholars who, who thought about how gender-based violence is conceptualized and, and often this idea that it's a brute, um, you know, stranger in the streets that, that perpetuates these crimes. And the more research being done to show that it's often within our intimate spaces that this happens. And then, gen and then faith leaders become first responders in these, in these situations. Um, so what helped us in this chapter was actually a conversation, Emiliano and, and Yusuf, between the two of you, uh, where Yusuf shared uh, three imperatives for global citizenship education, which I think was, was brilliant and really helped us to reflect on our contribution. Uh, the first was to create discomfort with deliberative pedagogical interventions, so to, so to disturb, to disrupt through our pedagogy. Secondly, and really important when engaging faith leaders, was creating an awareness of belonging to a community and the responsibility that that holds. And thirdly, uh, becoming responsive uh, for social justice interventions. And we thought these three points really helped us to think about what are we busy with uh, when, when engaging faith leaders through our pedagogy uh, in doing this work. So then in the second part of our contribution, we delve a little bit deeper into the module that, uh, that we constructed to engage faith leaders around this. Uh, it's a module that, that's actually supposed to do more around biblical hermeneutics, so the process of understanding biblical text, biblical hermeneutics, women and gender. And we reappropriated uh, this module uh, to still think about biblical hermeneutics, faith leadership uh, within the South African context, but then thematically uh, shaping it very strongly around uh, gender-based violence. So it's a 12-week uh, rollout, it's online, and, and we draw on a survivor-centered approach uh, and creating discomfort for greater awareness of positionality and the possibility for impact. And Judith and I has been, have been reflecting uh, for quite a while on, on this notion of creating discomfort and how do we do it and how do we draw on faith resources uh, to, to make this happen. And then in the third part of our contribution, uh, we share uh, one example of a discomforting uh, pedagogical practice that we, that we include, and this is the uh, viewing uh, of the Ellen Pucky's film. So it's a South African-produced film um, about a woman living on the Cape Flats in South Africa, 
and having a, a really complex time dealing with her young son who, who um, becomes addicted to, to drugs and, and sort of falls into a, a bad crowd. And then in the end, um, in a very traumatic uh, moment and sequence of events, uh, she kills her son uh, when he threatens like severe violence to her. Um, and we use this film because of its relatability, because of its South African situatedness. We use this film uh, in a term that we use quite a bit um, uh, as a reflective surface uh, to, to, to help viewers to draw from their own embodied experience as they enter into this encounter uh, with the film. Um, and we think this makes a contribution to decolonial practice as it allows the viewer to draw on their own experience as a site of knowledge production. Uh, so we use this form uh, to confront and trouble the viewer and to create discomfort in order to shift positionality. So some of the key themes that we argue for uh, in the film and that it helps us to set up these conversations uh, also with those who are present in our, in our module rollout is to think about gender-based gender violence um, as a trauma-inducing embodied reality that is informed by a constellation of factors. So we help students to think about the com complexity of gender-based violence in South African context, that it's not only the violence on the streets that we're interested, in, but also the violence in the sheets, in our intimate spaces, and what are all the things uh, that informs it. Secondly, we think the, the film helps us to think about men and masculinity and, and belonging. So this young man who falls into, into these complex circumstances, um, we, we see something of his own grappling with belonging and masculinity. And, and we think that the film helps us to have those conversations. And talking about men and masculinity uh, in faith space is not always easy. Um, so the film allows us to do that. Uh, thirdly, and this is probably the most confronting for students with, within this program, is we, we show through the form how faith practices and theological beliefs are, are sometimes some of the foundational things informing gender-based violence. And this is a very hard thing for students to grapple with, right? Because they're leaders of faith, they believe in this tradition, and then it's hard to look critically at some of the foundational theological beliefs that students hold. And then fourthly, uh, and this helps us as a springboard into, um, into some of the, the action that we hope will spring from this engagement, is we reflect on the complete system failure uh, that takes place in this film, how, how someone just falls through the cracks of, of no systems uh, that could help anywhere. And we, we help or encourage the faith leaders to start thinking how they could be first responders uh, and, and act in an embodied and compassionate way uh, when confronted with these realities. So in the concluding part of our reflection, both Judith and I weigh in on the conclusion and, and I share some thoughts around faith, how faith leaders should be capacitated to be first responders and a community of care for those uh, affected by gender-based violence. And Judith shares really great insights around um, GCE uh, alignment of, of the message that you're trying to get across, how method aligns with that and, and the mediums that you use in your pedagogy. And we, um, in, our, in our next round of fights, we hope to explore, uh, especially this last point uh, that Judith contributed. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, that, that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Charlene and Judith. It was really, really interesting to see uh, Yusef before has spoken about the virtu this virtue of GC, of, of agreement and disagreement, consensus, dissensus. So you are a practical example <laughs> of what... <laughs> exactly. We never thought we'd be posted children for anything, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. You are practicing one of the virtues of GC, one of many, uh, for sure, for, for what I've heard. So and thank you for bringing this. Thank you for bringing these 
reflection about the structure of violence, you know, around gender, religion, um, this discourse about peace and violence. Thank you for, for these. And that, thank you for also bringing these discomfort practices as a means of, you know, uh, um, 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 of starting as an ignition point for reflecting and critical approaches. Thank you very much. And also this these bit, this last bit, when you, you spoke about a bit of, about coherence, between, you know, when we are speaking about GC, uh, this coherence of contents, of means, of uh, methodologies. So thank you also for bringing this into the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we are going to the final speaker, uh, the Greg, Greg William Misiezek. Uh, he comes from China. He works in China as a, as a assistant professor of Beijing Normal University. So thank you, Greg, for joining us. Uh, we know it's in a personal sacrifice a bit to be here with us today because you are traveling but thank you for for being with us and the floor is yours great well good early morning everyone i'm in los angeles so it's about five now six a.m i'm actually in carlos abertorius's house who was the unesco chair of global learning and global citizenship education so i'm inspired by his library um so I'm, I'm going to make this uh, quite short because um, I want to leave uh, time for questions. Um, and also I want to first thank Emiliano and Yusef for um, inviting me to write a chapter and also the Angel um, Network and stuff, which I'm a, a member of some capacity of. I'm not sure exactly what. Um, so my chapter, or actually it was written by uh, Saeed Nidis Iftaka, Joel Kayomba, Maja um Kenyota and myself, Greg Mazasek. And actually, um all of the three previous authors were my students and wonderful scholars right now in Tanzania and in Italy and China. It, it, uh, sorry, India and China. I I um attribute any mistakes or any stumblings from the morning and also not not having enough of coffee. Um, so our chapter was. Uh, Southern Epistemologies for Disturbing Northern uh, Global Citizenship Education Models, Ecopedagogical Analysis and Reinvention. And I'm going to focus on the ecopedagogy aspect of, of our analysis. Um, Nidis, who is from India, and Joel and Kenyota, who's from Tanzania, brought in their own experiences, but also their in, 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 in those uh, lands, but also brought in the experiences uh, when they were in China, and they actually um, took my course, Ecopedagogy. They suffered through it. So what is Ecopedagogy? It's it's grounded in the work of Paula Freire. Um, it's, it's this aspect of how do we teach, how do we not teach, and what are the politics of us teaching, of separating the world, which is all of human beings and human societies, and the rest of the planet. And the aspect that we used with this, with, within this chapter is how can we disrupt Northern epistemologies to understand, to de-distance us from the rest of Earth for true environmental education, to, for true understanding, for ecologies of knowledge, like uh, Boraventure de Sousa Santos talks about, where epistemologies from the North is grounded in patriarchy, um, capitalism, and coloniality. So we really deconstructed this aspect of how can we teach these connections between critical environmental education, specifically eco-pedagogy, which is grounded in, in Furry's work and actually was going to be Furry's next publication, but unfortunately he passed away, but a lot of his work got, went into pedagogy of indignation. Um, a lot of his work at, was actually at his desk when he passed away on eco-pedagogy. So how can we use aspects of citizenships and use citizenships this aspect local to national, to global, to planetary. And a lot of the work that we did in the chapter is how Rio was talking about, how do we use the contested trains of GCE? How and how, um, say, Santos talks about, it's not only learning, but also unlearning epistemology to the North, especially constructs of citizenship, which a lot of people see, including G uh, GCE, that it's always positive, but obviously it's very much also negative. This aspect that citizenship is also a lot of times taught 
more as also who is the non-citizen and how should they be in society and things like that. And how can global citizenship, planetary citizenship, uh, and all and everything in between, how can it go towards this planetary understanding, this aspect of going towards globally all-inclusive social justice and socio-environmental justice, and also planetary sustainability. And we de deconstruct justice with sustainability and all those different aspects, um, including uh, through theories of feminism and ecofeminism, for example. So the, the aspect that we argue is that the need for e ecologies of knowledges, these aspects of if we are truly going to understand to be a member of the global community as, as a citizen, or even more so as a planetary as, aspect, as a planetary citizen, how can how can we de-distance ourselves on using models of citizenship? And how is Southern theory and how is epistemologies of the South crucially needed? And we use the work from Raywin uh, Kano, uh, from uh, Nidri, especially her um, her address for the comparative for CIS, a comparative and international education society, where she questions the use, the need of Ubuntu, for example, in comparative education or in comparative studies overall, questioning, asking, what is the epistemologies, the units of measure that we use, and how is that a lot of times grounded in northern epistemologies? So overall, what what, what we do in this this um, this chapter is really delve into not only how can we use um, uh, um, Southern epistemology, Southern theories for this aspect of going towards socio-environmental justice, but also to break down um, anthropocentric views, to, to disrupt the Anthropocene, to really delve into how can we de-distance ourselves from the rest of the world and use de-distancing and a lot, the, the, the authors, especially Needed, has done incredible work, including with Joel and, and Kenyoto, using my own work, um, uh, largely for my Rutledge book that's connected with eco pedagogy and GCE, and my other work on how can we use these different diverse epistemologies to truly understand each other, but also how nature, the rest of nature, that we're part of nature. And just ending uh, with the phrase that Mr. Godotti talks about, who's a Polyfair Institute um, director and founder in San Paulo. When I met with him in San Paulo, he said, "If the world, if Earth is a citizen with planetary citizenship, it's the most voiceless, oppressed citizen." And so, how can we connect all these different aspects of both justice and also sustainability, and all those other aspects of equality, and also disrupt? Like Viola was saying, and Carl uh, talked about these contested trains of citizenship and global citizenship. So, so there's a lot more to talk about, but I'll, I'll leave it there to leave more time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for bringing the eco pedagogy, for bringing sustainability also into this conversation. I'm, I'm, you know, my interest in the book is. Always increasing after each each <laughs> each presentation, uh, disturbing. You know, uh, it's a, a lot of words that are key words that are being said that promise a lot and that show the powerful um, character of this book, as Emiliano was saying at the beginning. So thank you very much for all of these presentations, Emiliano. It's up to you now to to choose some of the questions that were raised in the chat. Yeah, so we, we have, uh, thank you, Lasalita. So we have several questions. Um, is there, first of all, is there anyone who wants to post any quick question now, or we just get back to the ones that we see in the chat? Um, we have only about uh, 12 or 15, 12 minutes. So I'll go through uh, the order. Uh, of the question being posted here. Let me see. Um, uh, 
Okay, so let's go with the challenging ones so that we have an interesting conversation. I uh, see here a concept as global citizenship rather than they concentrate on the development of global competency, global competence. Um, so I realize that there are others form of global software software who might disagree with the view. But my question is, uh, this is, I'm reading a question from someone from the audience. Um, my question is, why have you chosen global citizenship rather than global competence or global education or some other term? And maybe this is clear once you read uh, the book. Okay, so I will briefly speak to this and then perhaps uh, someone else from the panel can also add. So the concept of global competence uh, or global education uh, are often discussed within the literature on global citizenship and global citizenship education. I would say that global competence is often more related to neoliberal approaches to global citizenship education, although I'm not extremely critical of the term. And why is global competence often associated with neoliberal approaches to global citizenship education? Because when you talk about global competence, you're talking about skills for the international job market, which are needed. Uh, our students need them, but they, are, they do not represent the final destination of a discussion around uh, um, fostering emancipated and critical global citizens. I would say that we need and there is a strong need to put at the center of our discussion on global citizenship education values, uh, ethical values, critical values. Um, what is lacking is a capacity of having respectful dialogue. Um, you see this in our leaders, in our politicians, uh, that is not a capacity to sit around the table and, and uh, put uh, an end to a, a potential harmful uh, conflict. There is not capacity to end and address properly climate change priorities. And so why our leaders do not address this? Because in my opinion, there is an extreme focus on uh, competencies, skills, skills for the international job market, and much less focus on ethical values, critical values, critical consciousness development, um, respect, respect for diversity, uh, dialogue, as I said before. So we need all of that. And so um, that's why we are talking about uh, critical approaches, the colonial approaches, social justice oriented approaches to global citizenship education. I hope this addresses this um, uh, challenging question, interesting one. If anyone else from the panel wants, I think Youssef wants to ju jump in on this. I think the critique uh, of using the notion of global can be legitimate if you argue that education only involves the human. Now, if you argue that education only involves human beings, human humans, then it means that you exclude things that might be post-human beyond the human. Notions of education which transcend the human. So if you want to critique global citizenship because you think it is too uh, centered around the, the idea of the human, then your argument makes sense. Um, then you, you, you can go towards a notion that probably goes uh, in the direction of post-global or transcending the global. And in that sense, I would acknowledge that critique. But if you want to argue that global citizenship education is too much concentrated about what is dominant in the North and, and the more hegemonic notions, then what we do in the text is to say, but you don't have to dismiss un necessarily the notion of global citizenship, you can reconceptualize it. You, you can actually give it a different meaning. And what we have done is we have tried 
to reconceptualize the notion of global citizenship education. That is why we uh, distinctly linked it to notions of uh, social justice, decolonization, human responsibility, not always issues taken up in the global north, but the way we articulate global is not to further centralize the notion of education and citizenship or citizenship and education, but rather to extend education and citizenship into a recognition of pluralism, that there are multiple ways of looking at citizenship and education. And that's more the angle we advocate from and in terms of which we articulate an understanding of global citizenship. Excellent. I can see Greg. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Emiliano and Yusuf were saying. Uh, and I think that, I, I think how I see it is this, the importance of this book and similar work, but this is a unique book in, in, in various ways, is this aspect that it very much widens it. I see the aspects of theories and foundations and problematizing GCE is an umbrella and, uh, and competency is one aspect of that. But I think the key thing and this aspect where definitely where it can become neoliberal with comp um, these uh, capacities is when it's not cri critically problematized throughout these different uh, well, the, the topics of this chapter, the the, the theories, the groundings, of the foundations, uh, the the critical comparisons between different um, epistemologies and populations and contexts and all this stuff. So I think that that that's I think what's more needed is this aspect of what is the gr the grounding aspects, the theories, uh, all these different things when we're con trying to construct. Um, capacities and um, I, I, th I think that's what I, I would um, it's very much echoing what was already said but I think that that's what is very much needed and I think this book is a very um, needed um, publication on that. Excellent thank you Greg I think we have only five minutes left I can see two interesting questions it will be challenging to address both uh, one is um, from Anna, good evening from the land of Yugera and terrible people in Australia. I would like to ask if you consider the migrant and indigenous community living in the Western country as well as Southeastern Europe as part of the global South. And then how do we move, this is from the land, how do we move away from measurement and assessment via domestication of global citizenship education discourses and rather resist this trend and move to more transformative and critical perspectives. So who wants to address the first question from Anna? Uh, anyone from the panel particularly? I think I think our chapter, what we go into, especially um, with Nidus coming from um, India and also um, Joel and Kenyoto coming from Tanzania, a lot of the experience that came out with um, in, in some of the chapter, and they've written other publications too, but this aspect of what are, were the experiences within China. And, you know, there's, a, you know, there's different ways of looking at China. You know, the, is it part of the global north or the global south? It's, it, it, it's, it's contested on, you know, how, how it's positioned and, and things like that. Um, uh, like uh, like a lot of things about China. So I think a, a lot of our chapter or some of our chapter goes into this aspect of experiences that they've had within China and not, not so much the West, but in, within China coming from different places and especially the, the differences between say, um, uh, coming from Tanzania as compared to also yeah. coming from India and things like that. So I think- right. I think our chapter is so much it, into that. Yeah, it's not so much the place where you live, it's about your tradition, respect for your tradition, advancing the values of your community. I think I think it, this is a very profound question from Anna because it brings into light the relationship between the local and the global and the fact that when we discuss global citizenship education, we do so um, with the profound respect 
uh, for the local traditions. And I can see Manisha wants to jump in. Yeah, very quickly, because you exactly said what I was going to say, that let's not <laughs> look at Global South as just, you know, a geographic territory, but rather mm. we define it in terms of experiences, you know, and that's why mm. we recommend that even the word colonization should be seen more broadly, because as I said, within the countries of Global South also, there are globalizations, you know, or in South-South relations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then anyone wants to address measurement, how we stop, how we move away from measurement assessment via domestication of global citizenship education? Who wants to address this? Yeah? I first want to come back to the, the, the question that we just discussed about um, uh, migration. And um, um, unfortunately, the division North and South is not the only division we have on, in this global world. So we have many divisions, we have many, many ways of inequality, and we should address them all. And it's good that this book focusing on the global south, but, but we should be aware of that inequality and, 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 and the lack of social justice is also part of our Western societies. And, and is particular mm -hmm. striking in the relationship with, uh, with migrants. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming back to the, the to the measurement uh, question, uh, I'm not fully against measurements, but we should take take care of that that the measurement is not only dominating the, the, the debates and the, and the educational practices. So uh, mm. we should we shouldn't take the point of view of being against measurement. That's important, I think, and we should look at at more let's say soft way of measurements and and global citizenship education. Mm. Not, only, not only testing the facts. Yeah, the challenge is, I think, to to look into values based uh, measurement and assessment more holistically, and less uh, strictly speaking related to measuring uh, skills uh, for the international job market. Okay, so I want to thank Angel. I want to thank uh, La Salete Cohelio for chairing this uh, book launch. I also want to thank very much all the speakers, Greg, Youssef, Manisha, Charlene, we all, uh, everyone who joined the meeting and uh, all the audience with very interesting questions. We really appreciate all the input. Thank you so much. La Salete, perhaps you want mm -hmm. to close uh, with some yeah. words? My uh, two final words. Well, first one is to, to thank uh, everyone that was present here, to thank Emiliano and Josef for for um, uh, launching the, this uh, this book with us here in this event. So uh, thank you for all the, co the contributions that were made here. In in my personal name and in, on behalf of, of Angel, I really appreciate the, this this uh, this event. Thank you very much for that.